Good evening and welcome to the final part of our conversation with Dr. Donna M. Richards, author of Urugu, an African-centered critique of European cultural thought and behavior. And what I'm arguing in, uh, in the chapter on religion and ideology that we have not understood as a people mm -hmm. is that every religion is a statement of, it is a, a sacralizing, a making sacred of a nationalist ideology. Every religion says to a particular cultural group, you are special, you are sacred, this is what you're supposed to be doing, you know, and this mm -hmm. is why you're here, and so mm -hmm. forth. Every religion is tied to culture, and what we have fallen for is this, this, this rhetoric of because that... Rhetorical ethic? Yeah. Uh -huh. And also the, 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 what I call the syntax of universalism, which mm -hmm. really got us, which is that there are universal religions, universal ways of, of thinking that go beyond culture. You see, that's there for everybody. Christianity is for everybody. Christianity has functioned in the service of European culture. That's the European power. Okay, now, the rhetorical ethic comes in. They're not going to say that. When they come to take over your land, they're going to say, we're here to love you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Speaking of taking over land, let's, let, let me read a quote from um, Urugu, an african centered critique of European cultural thought and behavior. The part that I'm looking for uh, deals with the Leopold oh. and his dealings in the uh, Congo. Congo, and maybe you can comment on on that. Um, I think you're quoting Cohen, mm -hmm. who says, "Quote: Whole districts were depopulated mm -hmm. of eight villages with a population of over three thousand." only 10 persons were left. Of another district, the population dropped in 15 years from 50,000 to 5,000. The Bolangi tribe, formerly numbering 40,000, sank to 8,000. King Leopold, it is calculated, netted a profit of between three and five million sterling and could call to God to witness the purity to his motives and his desire to promote civilization. Okay, that might be Chen Weizu. Is that uh, Cohen's no, quote? No, it says Cohen. Okay, the situation because now. there's another uh, book I would refer everybody to, uh, The West and the Rest of Us by Chen okay. Weizu, who is a okay. Nigerian author who, it's such an indictment of, of uh, European uh, colonialism, and it has, uh, it talks about that as well. Um, a lot in there. That um, touches on what I'm trying to get at in in this book, because one of the things I'm trying to do is to show the consistency in European behavior towards uh, Africans and 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 other non-European peoples. Um, one of the reasons that Leopold, who's only one, you know, right. in in many, we happen to know about him. You know, you could talk about Columbus and his governors and, and, and cutting off parts of, 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 of uh, people's hands and so forth. Um, one of the reasons that they're able to do that is because they can uh, make of human beings objects. Because they can see us mm -hmm. as things. You see, and that's why it's important to see the relationship between platonic thought as it has developed throughout European uh, development and what we are taught in school and that behavior. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do in, in the book is it's easy for us to hear this as an atrocity story. Mm -hmm. Say, that's an exception. Uh, isn't that horrible? But we need to see that in a very meaningful way, philosophers like Plato, who we say was so wonderful, okay, um, Descartes, uh, 
I would say even even Niebuhr, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a, a Christian philosopher, that they are connected to that behavior because they support a worldview or they 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 affirm and teach a worldview which makes it possible. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to see. We need to see the connection. We also need to see that given the Europeans' approach to reality and um, their, their lack of relationship to spiritual reality, that they are able to have that kind of behavior, the, the physical destruction of human beings, and at the same time to use the name of their God in relationship to it. Mm -hmm. And there's no contradiction. I have a quote somewhere from the Special Forces, which says, oh God, in your name, uh, help us, you know, to do what we have to do to these people. Mm -hmm. Because we do it. You know, you have told us to do this. Um, I have a, a quote, there's the, the uh, as Du Bois pointed out, the good ship Jesus. Mm -hmm. which was one of the first uh, um, slave ships. ships uh -huh. Okay. Um, there's no contradiction. Naming a slave ship Jesus. Right. The, the thought. Right. And then uh -huh. they have a whole prayer about mm -hmm. please don't let us lose too many people on, on this as we do this. Mm -hmm. Please, you know, make our injuries as few as possible as we go in to, to, uh, to mm -hmm. rape this mm -hmm. land and take... So, so let me ask you this. How do, how do you see black missionary work today mm. that is black churches who engage in uh, let me say and I because I don't want to just point fingers at particular people but that is one of the most extreme no not most extreme it's not one of the most extreme it's one of the most blatant Mm -hmm. one of the most obvious examples of African self-hatred that we would experience. It is not one of the most extreme. I think that we all suffer from a self-hatred and that it manifests itself in different ways. That um, certainly a, a, a missionary who is going among African people to preach a doctrine which uh, implies their inferiority um, is a sad phenomenon because they're talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. They have accepted another whole cultural form, whole cultural experience as being superior to who they are. And they have accepted that without thought, without questioning. What I'm trying to do is to get people to question at a fundamental level. That's what we need to go back and do. We need to, to question our basic assumptions about the nature of reality. And that's the hardest thing for people to do. So that a, a, uh, a black missionary is... Um, is denying spirituality because they can't say how can they say that these people that I represent this form that I represent is more spiritual than what mm -hmm. you have here how can, they can't say that mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying so they're in a religion which and they're is basically denying spirituality. saying what the, what the slave master said precisely that you have no religion that's worthy of that's right uh-huh uh -huh. they have accepted that mm -hmm. so in order for them to accept that what do they think about themselves you see, it's Woodson all over again, Carter G. Woodson. You don't need the shackles anymore. You don't even need the back door and the sign saying go through the back door. Because the conditioning is, is so thorough that we will make the back door ourselves. I want to ask you about the, uh, your thoughts on the so-called New World Order. But I want to read another quote um, that would... Um, uh, touch on that mm -hmm. uh, from your book again Urugu, African Senate Critique of European Cultural Thought and Behavior um, you're quoting J.B. Berry mm -hmm. here 
in the latter period of Greek history, which began with the conquest of Alexander the Great, there had emerged the conception of the whole inhabited world as a unity and totality, the idea of the whole human race as one. We may conveniently call it the ecumenical idea, right. the principle of the ecumen, or inhabited world, as opposed to the principle of polis, or city, promoted by the vast extension of the geographical limits of the Greek world resulting from Alexander's conquest and by his policy of breaking down the barriers between Greek and barbarian, the idea was reflected in the Stoic doctrine that all men are brothers and that a man's true country is not his own particular city, but the ecumen. It soon became familiar, popularized by the most popular of later philosophies of Greece, and just as it had been implied in the imperial theory of Rome, the idea of the Roman Empire, its theoretical justification, might be a common order, the unification of mankind in a single world embracing political organism. The term world, or this, which imperial poets use freely in speaking of the empire is more than a mere po poetical uh, or patriotic exaggeration. It expresses the idea, the unrealized ideal of the empire. There is a stone from Halicarnassus in the British Museum on which the idea is formally expressed from another point of view. The inscription is of the time of Augustus and the emperor is designated as, quote, savior of the community of mankind. That is an expression of the European Asili, is an expression of the European cultural ego, um, the need to constantly expand, to consume, and to control the universe and to dominate the world. It is, um, uh, I would say, marketed as um, a uh, spurious but doubtful um, humanism, universalism, um, desire to um, keep peace in the world, um, order the world, do away with difference. Um, the Pax Romana, which was supposed to be this great peace mm -hmm. that would be over the world, meant one thing. It meant Roman domination of the world. Um, the same thing with Alexander, uh, but more importantly, the same thing with Europeans now, and when I say Europeans, I hope everybody understands that I'm talking about European Americans as well, I'm talking about Europeans mm -hmm. wherever they are, that this talking about uniting uh, the world, there being one culture, one world, um, uh, saving uh, us from, from ourselves, so to speak, that that is a rhetoric that we fall into. The, the Christian rhetoric is the same. It is this universalistic rhetoric talking about universal brotherhood, where uh, actually what is being expressed is um, the asili seeking to fulfill itself, the, the uh, need to achieve more and more greater and greater European dominance and power throughout the world. How did the Romans do it? They did it by saying, order in the world is brought there through us, by us. We are the ones who bring order. Well, that's the same thing as saying, um, as imposing your culture on another group of people mm. so that you can control them, conquer them, subdue them, and make them victims. Um, that you read by uh, Burry uh, points to this uh, tendency, this thrust of European culture, which is uh, to rule the world. It's that simple. Uh, does it not show you also how old this idea exactly. uh, is? But it's an old one. Exactly. And it uh -huh. shows you the consistency. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we fall prey to is when so-called liberals, uh, critics, 
um, of European society um, would say that this only existed at a certain time or it only exists now or this is an exception um, they uh, avoid the fact that or the reality that there has always been a consistent thrust of European culture and that is this 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 drive um, I have another African term that I use for that. The, the energy source is the Utama Rojo, this drive to, to seek power, to seek control. Um, and that has, been, that has been consistent and it has now, it expresses itself um, in terms of what he calls this ecumenical, uh, ecumenical thrust, mm -hmm. um, which sounds wonderful, bringing everybody together. But you bring everybody together under you. Mm -hmm. So it is consistency that we look for when we use the concept of a ceiling. What do we do to ourselves when we hear President Bush or Clinton um, about the the new order mm -hmm. and um, and anticipate that order um, mm -hmm. and uh, what how should we is, are there any uh, tools of analysis mm -hmm. tools of I don't know what the word is that we can use that would make us when we hear things say okay um, bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -huh. And tools of, an, of analysis is exactly what it is. And that's why, why I've got developed, uh, or we have developed the concept of, of a Sealy uh -huh. um, and, and some other concepts that go along with, with a Sealy. You hear a statement from Bush, you hear a statement from Clinton, whoever it is, and right away what you say is, okay, how does this fit the Sealy? Uh -huh. Okay? The silly being, being the um, the ideological core of the culture, which helps you to see what is the political function of whatever it is that is being mm -hmm. done or said. Mm -hmm. It is the seed of the culture which continues to develop, but it is the ideological core. It is the matrix. It is the essence and the place wherein all the different aspects of the culture come together and can be understood as monolith, as one thing, okay? Now, this concept is simple. It helps to, to do away with all of the confusion. I have used it um, in an after-school program that I have in Harlem, where I work with, with young people, that once you identify this as silly, you just plug it in. The light goes goes off, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. and it's a, and you say, um, uh, or, or the light goes on, and you say, "Aha! Uh -huh, now, how should I interpret that?" I used an example with our with the, with the children. Uh, there was a headline in the paper: Bush sends so many thousands of troops in to um, into the Sudan. Um, into uh, Somalia, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I asked them, then it says, he is concerned that people be fed. Okay? I had laid out the whole conceptual model of a Sealy to them. And then we had interpreted European culture using that model. Then I said, now, how would you analyze that statement? Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. What we're looking at is the logic of European culture. That's what you have to do. You have to say, how does it work? That's what the Asili tells you. Okay? So you don't get fooled mm -hmm. by the rhetoric. So I said to them, and they could say to me, does it make sense knowing the European Asili, knowing how they have functioned throughout history, that Bush is going to be concerned with us eating? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't fit. 
you see it's inconsistent mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense then why would we think then how do we need to look at him sending these troops in the answer becomes because it's a way of extending the power of the United States of Europe of whatever okay so it makes things very simple for you and allows you allows us well, some, someone cutting you off, someone mm -hmm. watching might say, well, I am an American, as a black American, so what, uh, if America expands its power, my power is expanded also. Okay, um, and that person has to understand what they're giving up, okay, what they've committed themselves to. Mm -hmm. Now... Um, I'm going to say this on one level, um, which may not be meaningful for everybody, but needs to be, and that is on a spiritual level, that given the African conception of life, your life is not separate from that of other African people, nor is it separate from um, all of African existence in sacred time, not lineal time, which means that we have an accountability to our ancestors and to those who come after us and to the community. And so that you may think that you can get away with this and get, uh, what, uh, certain advantages, uh, uh, possessions, or whatever it is that that person is seeking for yourself. You see, and that's your reward. The spiritual reality is that you are accountable to something much larger than that. And so that, that you are fooling yourself, that is an illusion for you to think of yourself as an individual or as an American, because certainly Europeans don't think of you as that. See, you've gone for the rhetoric in doing that. One of the most devastating things um, about the European worldview and about European ideology for us as a people is individualism. Individualism is their basis for functioning. Individualism is devastating to African people. Connectedness is our strength. Community is our strength. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so that person who makes that argument is very, very short-sighted, to put it mildly, and is seeing things in a very limited context. Now, you can't, you may not be able to convince them of that, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it, 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 it will come out eventually, but people, because of how they've been conditioned, will have to see it. Well, I have to ask you this before I leave the Sudan, the Sudan area. Um, and why is it that uh, Adid and the other uh, the factions mm -hmm. in um, the Sudan, why are they called warlords? <laughs> Not that they are good guys. I don't know what no, about, I don't know about them. Right. Why are they called warlords? Right. And the folks in Bosnia, Very um, good. why are they just uh, I guess leaders or whatever I right what what um, because of the importance of language um, the connotation that language has we've fallen for that it is a trap mm -hmm. it immediately puts them into a certain context um, whenever um, the American public is to be galvanized around, um, uh, you know, a president's uh, um, uh, action um, against some, some non-European uh, country. You notice this. The terms barbarism, barbaric, will always come into play. That immediate, what's that, what that's doing is setting up... Um, your thinking, and to me it goes again back to, to Plato, where you, the warlord, see, is, 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 represents disorder. 
represents uh, 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 the chaos that must be ordered. So you have the saving troops going in to make order. So that's why they're called, they gotta be called warlords, just like African uh, uh, nations, language groups being called tribes because the association Mm-hmm. You see, mm-hmm. is is with war and and even though the folks in Yugoslavia are maiming children and killing exactly. children, exactly. You're not gonna children. you're not gonna find uh-huh. those same terms being used because you what you want to do is to call forth very interesting uh, uh, certain ideas that are attached to certain feelings that will make us then indict our own people and identify with uh, with the Europeans who are going in. One, one thing that I want to say um, that, that's important and also uh, maybe a little difficult to understand, but as we, st- the key is, and I would say to everybody, study the African worldview. Um, study our conceptions of the universe. Come back to who we are. No matter how much involved you become in, in European culture, et cetera, mm-hmm. can you ever become master? Right, good. In, in, that, in, in, in that house. Okay. Uh-huh. Obviously, the answer is that you can't. Uh-huh. That it is constructed so that you, you cannot become that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it will never be yours. Um, but the illusion is, um, and that's how they've done their job well, is that, uh, you know, everybody can move up in this. Look at what's happened. You know, um, you've you've got uh, a Colin Powell, you see, so you can become whatever there is to become. Doesn't matter that he or anybody else has to be functioning uh, in the interest of European power. 